In this episode, we talk about the reason why senior JMM leader and former Jharkhand Chief Minister Champai Soren has joined the BJP. We also talk about why actor and BJP MP Kangana Ranaut finds herself in a controversy yet again. But first, we talk about the Telangana MLC K Kavita getting bail in the excise policy case. Hi, I'm Chashang Bhargav, and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express News Show. On Tuesday, the Supreme Court granted bail to BRS leader K Kavita in two cases filed against her in the Delhi excise policy case. One by the Enforcement Directorate, which arrested her at a Hyderabad residence on the 15th of March, and the other by the Central Bureau of Investigation, which arrested her on the 11th of April while she was in Tihar jail. It is important to note that while hearing the matter, the Supreme Court criticized the Delhi High Court, which had previously denied her bail. When we spoke to Indian Express's Apurva Vishwanath, who writes on law for the paper, she began by telling us the allegations against her. So, the investigative agency's bare bones case is this, right? That there is a South group, which is a collective of businessmen, liquor businessmen specifically, who liaison with K. Kavita, because she's a lawmaker, to talk to the Ahmadmi Party network that is Chief Minister, Deputy Chief Minister, or whoever was involved in the excise policy formulation. And the allegation is that this South group gave kickbacks of about 100 crores to the Awadhi Party and its leaders, which was then used for the party's campaign in Goa, right? And the ED's statements, multiple documents say that Kavita was sort of this kingpin of the South group or she was the main person who was talking to Amadmi Party directly, right? So that's the sum and substance of the allegations essentially. And how do they arrive at this? They have statements of approvers. They say Kavita was in Delhi and on so and so and so date. She had meetings in these hotels which are not uh, really saying anything, but they all add to that narrative pretty much. But for a case to be made of money laundering, the investigative agency, that is the enforcement directorate, does not so far have a money trail against the leader. What they have is statements of approvers and connecting Kavita to some of the accused in whatever way, right? I mean, these will be questions that will be put to Kavita if she met someone specifically or if she knew of them and all that. But, you know, there are call record details, which means she made a call to someone who is also an accused in the scam. So the bare bones of the case is essentially this. So Kavita is a sitting MLC in Telangana. She's a daughter of the former chief minister of uh, Telangana. So her arrest was a big high profile arrest apart from, you know, the leaders of the Ambadmi party that we've seen so far. And now she's one of the several people who've gotten bail in this case. Just two weeks ago, Manisha Sodia was released on bail by the Supreme Court. Arvind Kejriwal has already got bail in the ED case. In a few days, that is on September 5th, his bail in the CBI case, an anti-corruption case, will also come up before the Supreme Court. So this is where the case stands. And Kavita, of course, had tried getting bail in the past as well. What is the reason that her bail was rejected by the High Court? So after she was arrested, Kavita did move for interim bail. The first, the trial court rejected her bail. Then, of course, the High Court upheld the trial court verdict and it also gave its own set of reasons. The big bone of contention here was that, like our listeners already know, the PMLA has a very stringent framework for bail, right? Section 45 of the PMLA virtually bars grant of bail. So the test before the judge is that the judge has to be convinced that there is no prima facie case against the accused and only then can bail be granted. The second condition, we keep calling this a twin test. The second condition in this is that the accused cannot be a flight risk or tamper with evidence, you know, that sort of a thing. The ED's case against Kavita was twofold. One, when she was called in for investigation and she was asked to submit her phone and her electronic devices for investigation. Kavita had formatted her iPhone. And when asked, the reason ostensibly was that she had to give the phone to her help. So, you know, the phone was formatted. Of course, the ED did make this submission even in the Supreme Court about who would give an iPhone to their help. But that's besides the point. The trial court and the high court had rejected bail. Amongst other things, one key issue is the section 45 has a very crucial exception when it comes to women. It relaxes the twin test when it is a 
woman. But however, in Kavita's case, the trial court and the high court vehemently said she can't be counted as a vulnerable woman because, you know, she's educated, she's a politician and there is no reason for her to be given such a exception. So this was pretty much the bone of contention in both these bail orders. And have we seen that happen before where a woman is denied bail because of this reason, because she's educated and therefore not as vulnerable? In that sense, in Kavita's case, the ED does make a very novel argument that she's not a vulnerable woman at all. This is a protection granted for women and children, even in ordinary criminal law. And when she was arrested, Kavita's son, if I remember, had board exams going on. So a bunch of these reasons were made to the court. But again, the argument is that she's also a lawmaker. It's not that she will flee the country or some such thing. But the High Court, in fact, had said that she's not a household lady in the sense that, you know, this is not any woman. So even within that definition that the PMLA, stringent definition that the PMLA has, the High Court sought to make a distinction between an educated, outspoken, not a household woman versus another kind of a woman. This, actually, the Supreme Court picked up on and said it's a perverse reading of the law. And the Supreme Court said that can't be allowed. So that becomes one of the key grounds on which Kavita is granted bail. Of course, the Supreme Court also asked questions of the ED's investigation completely. But this question of vulnerable woman was a key issue. Right. In fact, the Supreme Court basically said that by that rationale, no educated woman can get bail in such a case. But you know, earlier you were talking about Manish Sisodia getting bail. Now, in his case, the Supreme Court had said that he's been in jail for too long. It's been 17 months. The trial has not even started. Did the court make similar observations in this case as well? So even in Kavita's case, the Supreme Court does note that the trial is not likely to conclude anytime soon. However, the distinction is in Kavita's case, the agencies themselves told the court that they have completed investigation as far as Kavita is concerned. A charge sheet has been filed. So all that she has to do now is to sit and wait for the trial. And the court asks a question whether that is really needed, you know, that she be kept in custody for that period of time. But more than that, you know, in Sisodia's case, of course, he had spent much longer in jail, right? Kavita has spent about five months. Sisodia has spent much longer in jail. But duration of the trial notwithstanding, the court asks, is she actually related to the scam? What is the credible evidence to keep her in custody, right? So again, going back to that section 45 bail condition, there has to be a prima facie case. Uh, So the court asks, what is the prima facie case? Right, and here the additional Solicitor General S.V. Raju told the court that Kavita had tampered with evidence and hence should not be given bail. And which is one part of the twin test you talked about earlier, that the person should not be likely to commit any offence while on bail. But the second part of granting bail is that there should be reasonable grounds for believing that the accused is not guilty of such offence. So tell us what happened when the bench pushed for an answer regarding this. So, two issues came up. One is, of course, the statements of these approvers, right? So-called approvers who weren't accused earlier. But when they decide to cooperate with the agency, they give a fresh statement and incriminate the other accused in the case. That is one. Here we have a statement by Raghav Magunta. He is the son of a sitting TDP MP, Srinivasal Reddy, incriminating Kapita, right? The second, of course, is that SV Raju told the court that there are CDR which is basically call detail records between Kavita and the other accused. Essentially, that what that means is that there is record of Kavita calling the other accused, right? Is that enough to make a case of conspiracy and call her the kingpin? We can't really say that, except for these approver statements, which again will be tested in court during a trial. Will these approvers remain approvers till then? You know, they will be cross-examined. They will be questioned. But even those statements are circumstantial evidence. You need something else, a smoking gun here, which could be exchange of cash, which could be a money trail. None of that exists in the investigative agency's arsenal, at least at this point, which is something that the court probed and said there is no clear link between Kavita and the alleged crime. The second aspect is, of course, the court was picking up on how the agency is allowing someone to be an approver. So here the court actually said, you know, there are some people who are incriminating as well. So why hasn't the agency made them an accused or are they being given a concession? You know, even during the bail hearings for Sisodia and Kejribal, you know, lawyers have argued this repeatedly. 
that the approval statements are not the first statements that they came in and gave it to the agency. They've been changed over time. They've given multiple statements. And one of the statements incriminates somebody. That is where we are at right now. But there are other statements which don't as well. All of this is a matter of trial. But in a PMLA case, unfortunately, that it's a mini trial at the stage of bail also. So Kavita's case is perhaps the first case in the excise policy scam where the court asks these questions to the agency. These are substantive questions poking holes in the agency's theories. So Kavita's case was one of the first cases. But having said all of this, these were all observations in court while the hearing was happening. It gives you a sense of what the judges are thinking, but the order with qualitative reasons is yet to be put in public domain. And next, we talk about the former Jharkhand Chief Minister Champai Soren. After months of speculation on whether he would retire, start a new party or join another, we finally learned earlier this week that Soren, the veteran JMM leader, would be joining the BJP. The news broke out after Assam Chief Minister Himanta Biswa Sarma, who is in charge of the upcoming Jharkhand Assembly elections, posted on X that Champai Soren would join the BJP on the 30th of August. When we spoke to Indian Express's Abhishek Angad, he told us the JMM caught wind of this around the 17th of August. So, on August 17 night, he left for Kolkata. And on August 18th morning, he was in New Delhi. And there were speculations that he has gone to Delhi to meet some BJP top leaders. And uh, he would cross over to the BJP. So, August 18, 17 night to 18 morning, People in Hemant Sorin's camp were pretty much sure that something is brewing in Champai Sorin's camp and he is going to take some action regarding his future political career. Now, it turns out tensions had been simmering between the Champai Sorin camp and Chief Minister Hemant Sorin's camp. For those who may not already know, after Hemant Sorin was arrested by the ED in a money laundering case in January, Champai Sorin stepped in and held the position for just over five months. However, he was eventually made to resign after Heman Soren was released on bail. And it was during his time in power that Champai Soren says that he felt humiliated. The reason that he mentioned were, and the sources that tell us, that while Heman Soren was in jail, after a point of time, Champai Soren had refused to pay heed to some of the direction that Heman Soren was giving to Champai Soren. So the initial, the seeds of the discontent was sown by Champai Soren in when Heman Soren was in jail. So slowly when Heman Soren came out of jail, he wanted to take back power from Champai Soren. And what happened in between is some enthusiastic aides of Heman Soren started cancelling the CM event that was actually planned and where Champai Soren was scheduled to attend. So this led to a lot of humiliation, what Champai Soren is saying, that without him, his knowledge, many government events were cancelled. And this particularly humiliated him, showing that he had no place in the party. Champai was also reminded that it was Heman Soren who won the people's mandate, and therefore he should be the one to return to power. This also irked him. Now, despite Champai Soren being poised to join the BJP, Abhishek tells us that Heman Soren has not spoken out against him. Because Champai Soren is a very senior leader and after his father, he is the tallest leader in the GMM as of now, apart from one or two or more leaders. Now, by making Champai Soren as villain, it would backfire GMM and Heman Soren. And that would mean losing some of the tribal support base and also giving some ammunition to the BJP to fire against the GMM. However, sources say that privately, Heman Sorin always wanted to mend ways with Champai Sorin, saying that ki, your job was basically to play a supervisory role when Heman Sorin was not there. So why this entire drama when the talk of power transfer came into picture? So even Heman Sorin had gone to Champai Sorin's house. I remember reporting it when Heman Sorin was supposed to take the oath again after coming out of bail as a CM. He had gone to Champai Sorin's residence asking for what the issue was and whether or not uh, this can be sorted out. But initially, Champai Soren had refused to meet, but later he met. And eventually, he also came to Raj Bhavan, the governor's house, for the oath-taking ceremony. But Heman Sorin did want to ease out the situation, but it did not happen. Or the sources say that somebody very close aides of Champai Soren also did not want a very uh, smooth relationship to exist between Heman Soren and Champai Soren once he was asked to resign. 
he says with the assembly elections just 4 months away the party is now somewhat concerned particularly regarding the kolhan region of the state there is some sort of worry in hemant soren camp because that kolhan area has 3 districts and 14 assembly seats in the last assembly election it was a complete wipeout for the bjp bjp did not win even a single seat out of 14 seats in kolhan division and one of the seats is sarai kela from where champai soren comes now champai soren moving to bjp also means some of the cloud also moving to the bjp and if he is able to make a dent in three or four seats also or two or three seats could be a worry for the jmm as of now so it's troubling the jmm he says that champai soren is set to join the bjp at a time when the party has been struggling in seats reserved for the tribal community in the state in the 28 seats that is reserved for the tribal community in jharkhand the bjp in the last election won only two seats and that's the 28 seat which can actually swing the election in somebody's favor in some party's favor so bjp performed very poorly in the lok sabha elections in the tribal reserve seats in the five tribal reserve seats the bjp did not win even a single seat in jharkhand on the contrary in chatisgarh and madhya pradesh it bjp had done very well in the tribal seats so tribal community in jharkhand is little seems that little, little angry with the bjp due to various factor one factor being that the jailing of hemant soren and sort of narrative has been built that it was mainly due to the excess that the bjp committed or the central agencies committed so now hemanta's plan is to win at least 10 assembly seats from those st reserved seats Another region in the state with a significant tribal population is Santhal Pargana, located near the Bangladesh border. In this area, rumors have been circulating that the Hemant Soren government is not doing enough to prevent Bangladeshis from entering the region, and that Adivasis or the tribal lands and women are not safe in those areas because it's been taken over by the infiltrators from Bangladesh who's been coming now. immediately after joining the first post that champai soren makes is it's the bjp that is worried about the tribal and tribal welfare and well being and none other party than bjp is thinking about the illegal bangladeshi who's been entering santhal pragna area and taking over the land and our women are not safe so champai soren gives weight to the narrative that adivasis and tribals are not safe in santhal pragna area in particularly in under hemant soren's rule and this is how the bjp hopes to gain seats in both the santhal pragna and kolhan region with the help of champai soren now some within the bjp argue that him running independently would have hurt the jmm much more because the saffron party already has several influential leaders of its own for instance there is bharti janata party's state president who is bahul almarandi the second person is a former union minister arjun munda the third person is former chief minister and also a convict in coal scam case who is madhu koda and his wife his wife is there in the bjp who will also is supposed to run for elections this time now fourth person is the turncoat sita soren who is daughter in law of sibu soren then there are former uh, cm raghuvar das who is a governor of odisha now he may contest election may not contest election but if you are considering how many power centers are there within the bjp now comes champai soren so there are certain section who are feeling that there will be certain weight and there is something good will happen to the bjp and but there are some b- people in the bjp who think that it would have been better if you would have run from outside as an independent and gained support from the bjp from outside and in the end we talk about actor and bjp mp from mandi kangna ranaut who is once again embroiled in controversy just over a month before the haryana elections Kangna made comments about the 2020 farmers protests during an interview with a media outlet. When we spoke to Indian Express's Vikas Pathak, he told us about it. So Kangna Ranaut was uh, giving an interview to a media house in Mumbai, and uh, while talking about the farmers protests that happened against the three farm laws, which are now repealed, Kangna said that you know they were hanging dead bodies and rapes in the farmers protest. she also said that you know a bangladesh type situation could have emerged in the country had the country not had a, a strong leadership and uh, 
she also added that you know even foreign powers like china and the us they are all over the place in this country so in other words she was trying to see the farmers protest as part of a larger disruptive plan with criminal elements that happened this is what she actually said roughly now he says her comments were met with immediate backlash with congress leaders like pawan khera questioning whether the bjp supported her statement however the party quickly distanced itself from her remarks issuing a statement on the same day clarifying that kangna's comments did not reflect the party's position the party also uh, said that she should be cautious about making statements in future and she should avoid such statements so basically the party one both distanced itself from this particular statement saying that it is her opinion and not the party's opinion second the party said that it disagrees with this opinion and also advised her caution for future it was a kind of a veiled warning that uh, now that you are a party mp you cannot speak out of turn meanwhile several opposition parties and farm unions criticized kangna and demanded an apology from her here's congress leader supriya shrinath talking about the issue desh mein azad hindustan mein annadataon ko balatkari aur hatyara pehle kabhi nahi kaha gaya hai ye bjp ki sansad hai netritva ke bahut chuni hui hai aur unhone in shabdon ka prayog kiya hai भारतीय जनता पार्टी ये कह के पलड़ा बिल्कुल नहीं झाड़ सकती है कि ये हमारा मत नहीं है ये उनका वक्तव्य है अगर कोई आपकी पार्टी में ऐसी कुछ सत मानसिकता का व्यक्ति है तो उसको निकाल बाहर करिए ये मैं कभी होता है मैं हृदय से नहीं माफ कर पाऊंगा ये हमारा वक्तव्य नहीं ये नहीं चलेगा या तो निकाल बाहर करिए उनसे हाथ जोड़ के माफी मंगवाइए देश के किसानों पर और दूसरा आप खुद माफी मांगिए ये तो किसानों को बाला दिस वॉज नॉट द फर्स्ट टाइम दैट कंगना फेस्ट कॉन्ट्रोवर्सी ओवर हर स्टेटमेंट इंक्लूडिंग दोज about the farmers protests so regarding the farmers protest uh, there was a time when the protest was going on when uh, a photograph of a very old lady uh, visiting the protest site came out on the internet and she mistook that with one of those dadis from uh, shaheen bagh who was also featured i think on time magazine so she mistook the two to be the same and she said well the same dadi of uh, Shaheen Bag who was talked uh, about by the western media is also coming to the farmers protest and uh, then uh, she said that you know people are coming uh, to the farmers protest uh, for just 100 rupees now that sparked a lot of reaction and uh, it was also said on the social media that uh, first of all that the woman was not the same as the Shaheen Bag woman these were two different women she also got a court case slapped against her and uh, once this was brought to her notice and many people told her on the social media she deleted the post so that was one now after that we also uh, saw that uh, a cisf uh, a lady officer slapped her at the airport allegedly slapped her that's what kangana claimed a few months ago and apparently the woman also said that you know uh, while slapping her it was said that the woman kind of uh, shouted at her saying that you know even my mother took part in the farm protest and uh, you cannot be saying things like that This is just related to the farmers movement that apart she has made many statements that have baffled people like uh, once uh, she said that uh, the first prime minister of india was uh, subhash chandra bose she also once said that uh, the freedom we attained in 1947 was bheek mein mili hui azadi it was something that we got out of begging and she added that the real freedom came in 2014 apparently a reference to the year when narendra modi became prime minister of india and the bjp came to power with a full majority so she has been making such statements she once also you know compared um, mumbai to pok and next day part of her bungalow was also which was some illegal construction was demolished at that time now her latest statement has raised concerns for the bjp because the party has lost seats in haryana and has seen a considerable increase in the opposition's vote share since the farmers protests with the haryana elections set to begin on the 1st of october Kangna was in fact summoned by the BJP president JP Nadda to his residence yesterday. While the timing of the meeting has sent a clear message that was this was in continuation of the note of caution that she was told to exercise. There is a version from the party which says that Kangna Ranaut actually met the party president because her movie is about to release 
which is a movie on the emergency where she plays the role of Indira Gandhi and uh, she is uh, you know doing publicity for that movie right now and uh, she came to give him an invite so that version from the party tends to suggest that okay this is not something all that serious but then there are sources in the party there that say that once the meeting happens then of course the conversation goes on to other things also and apparently some sources in the party say that she was also told to exercise caution during the publicity so if we go by this version it means that in the mind of the party your publicity is one aspect but the publicity should not perhaps uh, mean that you start making very political or polarizing statements vikas usually bjp leaders are very tight lipped and they basically toe the party line when it comes to issuing statements now in such cases when someone sort of speaks out of line how has the party reacted to that in the past well it depends if the party still is open to some kind of a a correction in the behavior of the person then of course it will be something like uh, what happened here perhaps uh, that a statement would be issued dissociating the party with the statement of the person concerned and also uh, making it amply clear to the person that you don't have to speak out of turn sometimes it is also possible that it becomes a recurring process and uh, then the party uh, may also sideline the person if you remember pragya thakur became uh, member of parliament lok sabha from bhopal and she defeated uh, digvijay singh himself uh, in bhopal but she kept on making statements and within no time we saw that uh, she was sidelined today we don't uh, hear much about her and uh, pragya thakur was uh, got sidelined because of the statement that she made against mahatma gandhi and uh, perhaps uh, in favor of uh, nathuram godse and the prime minister said that i will not be able to forgive her from my heart it is possible that a certain level of uh, strong statements does help the bjp at times it kind of binds the core voter of the bjp but if you overdo it or if someone keeps overdoing it autonomously then there are moments when the party has to take a tough line because the party has to manage many other things its relations with other political parties at times its relations with other countries because it's a party in government so we saw the case of nupur sharma where uh, relations with the foreign countries because after all the bjp is the party in power today when there were serious reservations expressed by uh, countries like qatar then we saw that she also got sidelined so the party may do either of the two things one tell you not to do so and sometimes not tell you behind closed doors but make it amply clear to the world that we have told the person not to speak out of turn and sometimes it might even mean a complete sidelining You are listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcasts at IndianExpress dot com.